announcement is we have got a at 12:30 pm we have got a open space on zero mq by balaji it's on first floor so those of you who are interested you can go there uh that's it and i hope the password is still working uh in audi 3 also we have got open spaces on audi 3 so you can just check out from the volunteers uh thank you arun our next speaker is anand chittipotu uh, he is going to speak on the topic messing with government data using python he is a co-author of web.py a micro web framework in python he currently works for internet archive and active member of indian python community thank you Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So this is something uh, unusual. I mean, I didn't um, expect I'd actually talk about messing with government data in a Python conference. Okay. So I did something unusual during these elections. So what I did was I volunteered to provide the technical assistance to a couple of election campaigns. Uh, how many of you have worked in an election campaign? Raise your hands. That's very few. Okay. So. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> so uh, I was very fortunate to uh, ass be assisted with an election campaign uh, long before. Uh, so in Hamba, a friend of mine contested for uh, 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 candidate for assembly election. So I was uh, keenly following it and helping him in building his website and was looking at how the election campaign runs. I mean, uh, how it runs is it's just chaotic. Okay, so anything that you want is not there. So if you ask someone how many volunteers do you have, he has to call someone, and he'll have somewhere sit, he has the information somewhere in an Excel sheet or somewhere, and uh, he won't be available at the time to take the call. Okay, so he'll probably take a couple of hours to get very basic information uh, like how many uh, volunteers we have or how many uh, places we have covered, etc. Okay, so what I did is uh, I provided technical assistance to uh, help in solving some of these problems. So let me give a brief uh, background of how it started. Okay, uh, in December, um, I decided to move out of Bangalore and I moved to Vishakhapatnam and was uh, uh, relaxed and uh, sitting quietly. Okay, and suddenly I got a call from a close friend of mine. He called me and said, uh, "Hey, Anand, uh, I'm taking off a year from work." I said, "Wow, that's nice." Okay, what are you going to do? He said, "I'm volunteering for a political party." Wow, that's unusual. Okay, so I said, let me know if I can be of any help. Okay, so uh, one day he called me and said, uh, uh, we probably need your help in uh, uh, providing some tools for the campaign. I said, okay. I said, don't take much of my time, but it ended up being a big adventure, and I'm going to talk about the challenges that are faced during this process. Okay, so during this process, I actually ended up building a lot of tools. I built a campaign management system. Uh, uh, by the way, is the font visible to the back? No. Sorry. Okay. So that now. Okay. But well, that will probably cut down. Uh, I guess there will be much test anyway. So uh, you probably have to. Uh, I'll probably read it out. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. So I ended up building a campaign management system, a volunteer sign-up system, a web app to find voter ID details by voter ID, and a script to format voter IDs in a PDF form, in a compact form, so that it can be printed on paper, and a lot of other tools as well. Okay, if you can see, that's my GitHub contributions. Okay, from February, mid February to April, that's when the elections were. Okay, you just see a spike in my activity. Okay, I was all writing code and then commenting, and uh, there's a lot of uh, activity. Okay. So that's the period when I did all this work. So since most of you haven't uh, followed elections very closely, let me give a glossary of the terms I'm going to use uh, in the start, so that you're comfortable with these terms. Okay. So one is a parliamentary constituency. So a parliamentary constituency is like Bangalore North, Bangalore South. So parliamentary constituency will have about six to eight assembly constituencies. So Habal is uh, an assembly constituency in Bangalore North. And uh, there are wards inside an assembly constituency. You have uh, JC Nagar ward uh, in Nepal, 
and Sanjay Nagar uh, different wards and uh, there is a polling center. Polling center is where uh, it is typically a school building but will have uh, uh, that is where the elections are uh, conducted and it will typically have uh, a bunch of polling booths. So there will be multiple rooms in the polling center. So they have polling center uh, some public school and they will have uh, room 1, room 2, room 3. So those are the polling booths and uh, every voter will have a unique voter ID and the uh, voter will go and then uh, cast his vote in one of these polling booths. Okay. Now, uh, this process a lot of challenges. I mean, uh, so first of all, I mean, I'll show you the slides of, uh, let me show you this couple of challenges that I faced. Okay. So this is uh, uh, one of the things that I built. Okay. This is a screenshot from one of the tools that I built. Okay. This is a uh, campaign tracking tool. Okay. So what it does is, it basically uh, has the hierarchy of all the places in the constituency. Okay, so this is uh, so in Karnataka. So we have Karnataka and uh, uh, and this is assembly constituency. And inside the assembly constituency, if you look at uh, uh, the text here, it says it has eight wards, uh, seventy-five polling booths, and so many polling polling centers and polling booths. So now, how do you get this information? Where is this information available? Okay, so even just to get the basic system up, you need to know what are the different kinds of places that you have. Uh, in your state and your uh, parliamentary constituency. And if you look at the uh, progress bars there, it's kind of showing the number of uh, uh, booth agents that we have and how many more we need to actually uh, uh, to be able to uh, cover it completely. Okay. But so they're, they're not very interesting at this point, but the talk is really about how to get this data. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so let's see that. Okay. So it's the same page, but at the uh, the previous page was at an assembly constituency level, but this page is at a polling booth level. Okay. But if you see on the right, it's showing you the navigation. You have Karnataka, Bangalore region. The region is actually stated by hand. But and you have uh, a parliamentary constituency, assembly constituency, a ward, and a polling center, and a polling booth. Okay. And in the bottom it shows the neighboring uh, other polling booths in the same building. Now, where is information available? How do you get this information? Okay. So first thing is, how do you find the mapping from polling booth to, sorry, uh, parliamentary constituency to assembly constituency? Apparently, uh, the government don't speak that language. They actually have different nomenclature. They actually have districts and assembly constituencies. They don't talk about parliamentary constituencies. Okay, but the elections are happening uh, in uh, <coughs> parliamentary constituencies, and you want to know assembly constituencies so that uh, the work can be divided and then tracked easily. Okay, the only place I could find. Uh, a reasonable uh, uh, data about this is a Wikipedia page. Okay, so this page has uh, the constituency number and name, and all the assembly constituencies in that uh, parliamentary constituencies. Okay, so now how do you get this information? I write the Python program to scrape it. Okay, that's not too hard. But let's look at the the uh, polling booths. How many? When how many polling booths do you have in the assembly constituency or what are the polling booths in the assembly constituency? There is an election commission website and that has one web page for every assembly constituency. It has uh, names in Canada and English. Uh, actually, they have English only for Bangalore region. For others, they only have in Canada. Now, uh, those are the polling booths that I've shown in the previous slide. Address of Jamandir, uh, room number 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. So, there are five polling booths inside the same building. Now, I first I have to extract this information and then, I didn't, and then load them as polling boats and then somehow smartly I have to identify that all the five polling boats are in the same building. How do you know? I will do some text processing, figure out uh, all of them are in the same, are actually the same uh, uh, place. So, I am going to load some Python programs to uh, do some grouping uh, based on some heuristics and then identify the polling centers. So we have, we have got parliamentary constituencies, assembly constituencies, polling booths and polling centers and what about the ward? Apparently, this is a PDF of voter rolls. So election commission gives uh, one PDF for every polling booth containing information about that booth and all the voters. This is a PDF file and that's the only place where you can find 
where the, uh, which uh, ward your polling booth belongs to. So, if you want to build that, just to get the big bones of the system up, to ability to navigate through all the localities uh, in your state or in your parliamentary constituency, you have to parse all this information. That's fine, isn't it? Okay. So these are the things that these are the sorts of data I need to extract before I can start doing something. And there are many tools are built on the way. So one of that is a volunteer sign-up system. Uh, so, uh, so this all these things are done in very short span of time, about four to five days, and the requirements are rapidly changing. And uh, uh, people actually, the election campaign, uh, I mean, goes on its own path. For example, they start with an approach, and there doesn't work. They want to do something else, so you have to uh, change your software to meet those needs. So one day, uh, uh, the government said, uh, uh, "See, the volunteers signing up volunteers is not working very well. Okay, we're, there are a lot of people signing up, but uh, they're not becoming volunteers. We need to fix that problem. The problem was the process that they had was very time-consuming. In sense, the turnout time was very high. In sense, when someone uh, uh, shows interest to become a volunteer." And the movement and, and the time it becomes volunteer, there's a lot of time gap. Okay. The reason was uh, the approach they took, or usually that happens is you uh, give a missed call to some number, or you go and fill a web form, and someone will call you and then ask you where are you from and what can you do, and then you become volunteer like that. Okay. But the, the issue with that is it has to go through a central process. Okay. So usually delay. So usually there like two to three days or even a week delay between you sign up and. Uh, you get a call and then you get confirmed as a volunteer to work on something. So, uh, so they called me and said, uh, can you build a form where people can search for their location and then know who is a coordinator and then contact them directly. I said, that doesn't sound like an interesting solution. So I thought for a while and built this. Okay. So what is this is, it's a, uh, so I did it in two different stages, one for the volunteer sign up, other for the booth agent registration. And it's, it's the same thing. Uh, there's a field called locality. So the whoever is signing up will fill in the locality there. So they'll go and say RT number. So what it does is it uh, does gives an autocomplete using Google uh, auto uh, location API. And it identifies the location. And I've built a service using which it figures out uh, what what it is, what assembly constituency it is, and what parliamentary constituency it is. Okay. So the moment someone fills this form, I know which ward is from, which parliamentary constituency, and which assembly constituency is from. Okay. So the moment he fills a form, an email gets sent to the person and the ward coordinator introducing each other. Okay. Now we can start working immediately from that point in time. Okay. So the whole delay of two to three weeks to one week is completely cut down by the system. But unfortunately, it was built very late in the cycle and they couldn't really uh, make use of this very much. But nonetheless, it's a very interesting system. Okay, and this is other part of it. Uh, uh, this is for adding a volunteer. So the previous one was people signing up. This is uh, internal to the system, and uh, the admins want to add someone as a uh, volunteer. So instead of locality, there is a voter ID field. So when someone fills an voter ID, it has to automatically figure out which polling booth he belongs to, and then add him as a volunteer there. Now how do you do that? So I'd given the voter ID, I should go and figure out I and mean, query the election commission website and find out what, uh, I mean, uh, which polling booth he belongs to and then add him as there. Okay. So that was other challenge. Okay. So one option is to query the election commission website. The other thing is to preload the data from some form. Okay. So where do you have that information? Okay. Uh, I'll get that in a minute. But uh, uh, just like one day before the election, uh, uh, there was a uh, need for building a small website wherein from voter ID you can uh, find your polling booth. The reason was, this was already there in election commission website, but as expected, all government websites don't work where there's a need; they go down, right? So, as in fact, it happened even here. Uh, election commission website in Karnataka didn't work uh, on the election day. In fact, uh, they uh, made plans to scale up. So, what it is, uh, I think they had an ASP dot end application or something. Uh, they made a copy of it in three different directories and then gave three links, hoping that that will work. That will take 3x the load, but it doesn't work. 
Okay, so I built this small service. It just says find your polling booth in Bangalore. You go and type your voter ID. It tells you uh, which polling booth you are from. Okay, so if you have ever observed on election day, you see a uh, lot of people sitting uh, from representing different political parties on a table with a voter list in their hands. People go and say, "My name is this, and where should I go and vote?" Okay, or uh, they'll come and shout at you, uh, "My wife's name is there, my name is there. What are you doing?" Okay, so uh, so what these volunteers do is they go and help these people. Uh, I tell them where they should go and vote. Uh, so inside the booth, uh, the booth, uh, what are the booth in charge? Uh, the uh, the the booth manager in charge will have a sheet of orders. And then there is serial number for each voter. Okay, so what each voter should do is should they sh he should go with uh, what's his booth number, and that's called a part number, and what's his serial number. You should take those two things and then show it inside the booth. Then they look at uh, uh, that in their list and make sure he's that person and then let him vote. Okay, so now for every person that comes to the table, we have to give him what is his booth and what's his serial number. So that's what this thing provides. Okay, but where do you get that information from? Okay, that information is uh, only available in the PDFs that are given by the Election Commission. Okay, I've uh, put a, I've put some uh, bars in that the names are not visible because I know it will be a privacy issue if I expose all that. Okay, uh, so this is a PDF containing all the voter information. Now I have to extract this and build the database. And also, there is another uh, interesting thing is now, uh, on the day of elections, you have to put a table and then uh, show this thing up. But this has to be printed. So each polling booth typically has about 1,000 uh, voters. And each sheet prints has about uh, 30 entries. So that's closely uh, 30 sheets per polling booth. And parliamentary constituency has about 2,000 polling booths. So that's like 60,000 pages. Just for one single copy, or to pitch 60,000 pages. That's so much of uh, papers and also so much of money. Okay. So, uh, and there's other uh, issue is now, this is a uh, voter uh, list for one polling booth. Uh, a polling center, the school building, will typically have four or five polling booths inside. If someone comes and says, Where is my polling booth? You have to look and tell him where he is from. Okay. So, which booth he belongs to. So, the uh, typical way is uh, people use book force. So they actually put five people each holding a, a one sheet in a, one of these lists and someone comes and asks where is my polling booth? All of them start searching and whoever finds will tell the answer. Okay. I mean that could uh, and it's very very inefficient. Okay. And also it's not sorted by any name or something. You have to go and then search. Okay. So what I did is I wrote a program to extract this information and uh, Combine all the voter IDs in a polling center together. So you have five boots, all the five boots are combined together, started alphabetically, and then printed in a compact form. Now, if someone comes and says, What's your name? You just quickly search through this and then tell uh, what's his booth and what's his serial number. Okay, now this has about close to 150 entries per page, whereas the previous one has only 30 entries. So it's actually 5x saving and also. So basically, I'm building a database index on paper, right? So you, uh, you can you can do uh, binary search and find, figure out uh, where's the name. Whereas uh, the previous one, you're doing a sequential scan on a database table. Here, you're doing an index scan. So this was uh, uh, very useful because it saved us, saved them a lot of money, and also you're able to uh, uh, tell them uh, which booth very very fast. And there's other so these are things I did in Bangalore. And back in where, uh, where I live, Vishak Patnam, uh, I uh, 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 gave the sheet to them on the day of elections. Okay, so there are very few number of volunteers. So I told them, since you already have very less volunteers, I suggest you to concentrate on the first chunk. Okay, so these are the polling centers which have most number of voters, uh, most number of polling booths. So those schools or those buildings get more voters. So if you have limited number of volunteers, you better send them there first. Okay, That would cover close to 40-45% of uh, the voters. If you just send to those 10 uh, polling uh, centers. The remaining set is uh, uh, ones which have more than 4 or more 
uh, polling centers, polling boards. And uh, so that was very helpful because uh, just with this information, they are able to uh, do the scheduling of where to send those volunteers. And again, so this information was possible just because I have the data about uh, of grouping the polling centers, polling booths together as polling centers. And so this is, I mean, there are a couple of things that I've uh, done during this period. Okay, but the fun part is now how I did these things, right? So, so let's look at the approaches that I've done uh, for solving these problems. Okay, so first thing is parsing HTML pages. How do you parse HTML? So, uh, what I realized is beautiful soup is pretty good. So there are a lot of uh, scraping frameworks that people use. I mean, I kind of find it they're actually counterproductive. If you start using those frameworks, it actually slows you down very much. Beautiful soup is very simple, and you can start using it easily. And uh, uh, always save intermediate results because saving intermediate results will save you a lot of time. Because when you are scraping, uh, when you are parsing uh, thousands or even uh, <coughs> tens of thousands of pages, somewhere in the page they'll have malformatting or some Unicode error. You'll start start doing it from again from the beginning. Okay, so all saving intermediate results will save you a lot of time. And ASP.NET is the worst thing that ever happened to web. Uh, so our government loves ASP.NET. Every government website you see is built in ASP.NET. Okay, so I had a real fun time extracting data from all these ASP.NET websites. So let's see how do you, I mean, uh, what kind of tricks you can use to actually pass information from those websites. Let's look at beautiful soup. Oh, is this visible? No. Okay. I'm very sorry. Okay. But now, yeah, I mean, these are the only place we need to look at the text. Uh, okay. So, uh, beautiful soup is a beautiful soup four is the newest version of the library. You import beautiful soup, and then you create beautiful soup using HTML, and then it has different uh, two different ways of selecting elements. One is you can select that using uh, a CSS selector. So you can say, I'm trying to parse the uh, uh, polling booth information from the election commission website that previous slide that I have shown you. So that is the idea of the table and then I am taking all the rows. So that gives me all the rows in the table and then the first one is header, it just takes what is the name and what the header of the table. I skip that and for each row find all, that is other API to find. So I am finding image children which are TD. So I got the TDs and then I extract the text and then send it. Okay. So this uh, pretty simple, right? There is nothing uh, fancy uh, happening here. I just find out the right uh, uh, element by the ID, then take all the elements and take the text of it, out of it. Okay. So, uh, saving intermediate results. Okay. <coughs> so, this is other interesting thing that I have done. Um, in the scraping process is I wrote a small little called disk name voice. What it does is it saves the results of this page in that file. If the file is already there, it just returns the result. Okay. So now when you are uh, scraping 10,000 pages, if it uh, passes 1,100 files and fails there, when you restart the script, for the first 100 it reads through those files and returns and then starts from the, the next one where it failed. So that saves you a lot of time. Uh, so let me show you. Uh, how this disk memo works. That is a decorator. What it does is uh, you can specify the file name or you can say how to construct the file name from the parameters. You could say uh, take the parameter AC and then uh, 0, 3D is, uh, uh, I mean, if the number is less than, width of it is less than 3, just uh, put zeros in the beginning. So it will make AC 0, 1, 2 uh, underscore boots dot ESV. Uh, so you can specify that by uh, the name of the parameter, or you can specify by the position. And if you see it here, saying one, the position parameter one, so that is state. Sorry, the district. That's dictionary. So I'm taking the attribute state and the attribute district of it, and then saving it. Okay. So, so that was uh, very helpful because I don't have to write the same code in all the files. I mean, all these functions. Also, it supported different formats. If you see the first one, the format is JSON. So it serializes it as JSON and saves it. The second one it saves it as a TSV file, and it reads back as CSV. Okay. So now the the ASP .NET part. Okay. So 
if you see, oops, I'm sorry. Something ran forward. Okay, <coughs> so if you see, uh, when you select a drop down, oops, shit, sorry, something is missing. Okay, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> if you uh, look at any ASP.NET website, you typically find a lot of drop downs. When you select a drop down, it sends a post request to the server. And if you click on any link on the page, it again sends a post request. Okay, so it's the worst abuse of uh, uh, REST principles I've ever seen. Okay, so I mean, anyway, you click on the link, it sends a post request. Okay, and along with it, it sends a lot of uh, fancy things. Um, sorry, it's not visible at the bottom. It usually has a special uh, hidden field in the page called unsequenced sort of view state. It's a huge I mean, it's string containing uh, probably base 64 encoded string, and at times it. Uh, becomes bigger than couple of MB, okay. And it sends it along with every single thing that you do. Uh, well, so I had to work around all these things. So what I did is, I built this, uh, small utilities for working around, okay. So there is a function, get select options. So I'm giving the, I, uh, the name of the select it, what it does is it parses that using visual soup and gives me all the options available. Now I know all the districts I have in the state. Now I loop through each of them and then finds out all the assembly consciences in the district by selecting the uh, other drop down. And then I want to find the boots inside each one of them. Okay. Now I start afresh again. I select the option that sends a post request, comes back. And I, I, then I select the assembly constituency. It goes, sends a post request and comes back. Now I have an HTML page containing all the boots. Now I go and parse it. Okay. Now it's uh, too tedious, but the thing is, these functions make it very easy to do because you're almost as if it's actually going manually and clicking. Select the uh, district drop down and then select this. Uh, click the assembly constants drop down and select this value, and then you parse it using beautiful soup like you did before. Okay. Now the fun part is parsing the PDFs. So how do you parse PDFs? So this, uh, uh, you must have seen this thing, XKCD modified for the stock, okay. So uh, it's pretty tricky. So don't worry about the text because it's not meant to be visible. Just converted that into uh, text. So <coughs> okay, so uh, what I did is I converted the PDF into text using a tool called PDF2 text that comes with XPDF library in Linux. So this have this plain text with me, and I need to parse this and find what information. How do I do? Okay. So now first I have, I wrote a function, read section. I should probably, okay, read section. What it does is, uh, from those two markers, two dot details of part and polling area and three polling session details, it selects the text between those two. So I basically have a huge chunk of text. I'm trying to uh, window down the region that I'm interested in. Okay, so I comes down to this part. Okay, what I do next is I identify the index. So this is in the text. Okay, so I want to identify that uh, the index of these where these things appear. Okay, now uh, this data is a lot of times uh, I mean, have all weird kind of things. So sometimes I can find a ward uh, member on the left side, or I can find something uh, near police station. Okay, then I'll probably think that. The, the index is wrong. So what it does, it takes three, four things and finds the best of all of them. If there is some outlier, it ignores that. So and somehow you really find that line where that information starts, and then I select just that region. Okay. Now uh, from the whole PDF, I've cornered down to small window which has the relevant information. Okay. Now I take it from the ward number to polling station. That gives me the ward number and the ward name. That's fun, isn't it? Okay, so that's all. I mean, you have to I'll do all this thing to uh, get just the word information of a polling booth. Unfortunately, it's not available anywhere else. Okay, and um, the other uh, volunteer sign-up system I'm showing you that uh, uh, there's a map-based thing. For, fortunately, I don't have to do much work. Uh, 
Open Bangalore uh, and Data Meet groups, uh, they have made uh, Bangalore wards and uh, parliamentary constituency maps available. So all I had to do was take your maps and then write some small Python program to build those APIs. That, was, that wasn't hard. I mean, there was some learning about uh, 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 OpenJS, GEO and all that, but that wasn't uh, too complicated. And the last part is the formatting water lists. So I did uh, uh, the form uh, water list formatting I've shown you, right? Um, made a compact water list. So that was, I used uh, report life for doing it. It worked fine, but uh, uh, there was a small uh, tragedy uh, on the day of elections. Okay, so one day before, uh, two days before elections, they told me that they want it to be done like this. Okay. I wrote a program and tested for one polling center and it worked fine. I said, okay, I'll give you by tomorrow morning. So they told me that they want it by 10 o'clock so that they can send it and then print it and then be ready by evening. And then I started running it and realized the program is stuck at some place. It's not coming out at all. So I have a report lab and it's it generated some PDFs, but something it, it just got stuck. It's not working at all. So I went and saw why it's not working. I saw that uh, so that polling uh, center has more than 10 polling booths and the number of places are more than 100. And somehow it gets stuck there. So I tried different things and then didn't work. So I thought, uh, we just had one day, I don't have time to understand report lab or switch to something else. So I thought, uh, let me put on a high-end machine then get it done. So I thought I'll go and buy an EC2 server and then run it and then solve it. I went to EC2 and then uh, ordered a server and said, you don't have, I mean, your limit don't allow you to create that. Please send an email so that to activate it. I had just one day left, I can't wait for them. So I went and a server in Linode and, and then started running it, the same issue, it got stuck there. Even uh, So I started running these things in parallel. So ones which have li less number of polling boots finished, but the ones which have more number of polling boots didn't still work. Okay. So I spent some time and realized uh, there are some performance issues with the report lab. So if there are too many entries, it takes too much time. Probably there is some order and square issue inside. So what I did is, when I look at each page, each page has 144 entries. So I know how many entries each page has, okay. I can as well split the data into 144 entries and give it a report lab and then generate multiple PDFs and then combine them later, okay. So that's what I end up doing. But uh, I lost a lot of time and money by the time I realized this, okay. So it's already uh, like um, evening of the uh, day before elections by the time I realized the solution and what, but uh, can solve the problem. Okay, so, and so these are the challenges and fun that I had during elections, and I couldn't resist and continue to mess around. So if you can see again now, that's my GitHub history. I started uh, messing with more government data and then started improving the system. And the good thing is it's all open source, it's all available online. Okay, so if you want to take a look at it and you want to play with it, or you want to collaborate with me and work on these things, you're welcome. Yeah, and. The, this is a brief summary. It's uh, uh, messing with government data is really challenging and a lot of fun. I, I, mean, I recommend all of you to try it once. A uh, beautiful soup is enough for parsing HTML and even ASP.NET websites. You don't need any uh, special web frameworks. I, I even think they are uh, counterproductive. Saving intermediate results save you a lot of time. Parsing PDFs is a bit tough but not impossible. All this data will be very valuable when made available openly. So that's what I'm trying to do. So let me know if you have any questions. Hi. Uh, hi. First of all, it's a very interesting uh, work. It's uh, really like uh, I appreciate your courage to uh, take this challenge up. So what I want to ask is whatever you have developed, what is the future of that? Are you having any plan to use these tools in the forthcoming elections or any other plan? Yeah, so so <coughs> thing is, the system that I've built is probably going to be used in the next elections, but uh, all the data I've been continuing to use and then use it in uh, other places, okay? So in fact, uh, uh, just before coming two days back, I was uh, trying to uh, get the Delhi uh, data, okay? So Delhi polling booth names are not there on the election commission website, like we had in Karnataka, okay? Even the polling booth names are available in the PDF. Now I had to write a program to parse those PDF names, and then I can come by as polling booths, and blah, 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 okay? 
So it's very, uh, it's very valuable and very challenging. Yes, uh, mic here, please. Can you ask him to sit? Yeah. Can you please sit down? Yeah. Yeah. I can uh, yeah. Just said that uh, we have some uh, performance issues, and obviously, yeah. actually, when we are scraping like this kind of huge data, especially with uh, like beautiful super that kind of uh, libraries, there will be scaling issues. And you just mentioned about one issue that you got around with some hacking, uh, like running it parallelly. Uh, do you have? Uh, have you? Uh, do you have any? Uh, scalable solutions uh, or any techniques that you have used for? Well, I don't think the beautiful soup is a performance issue. Performance issue was in report lab in generating the final report. Okay. But that I worked around by limiting the data size. Okay. But beautiful soup was perfectly fine. There's no performance issues with that. Okay. Once um, I, ha I have used uh, beautiful soup. Actually, it was a huge page. Uh, okay. and it, was uh, it was actually taking like at least uh, like 30 seconds for uh, to uh, get the data, at least one data. So beautiful soup uh, can work with multiple parsing engines. Okay. So if you create a beautiful soup with the second argument as LXML, it tries to use LXML library, which is a C library, which is pretty fast. Okay. So you can look at the beautiful soup documentation. Search for beautiful soup on LXML. That should uh, uh, give you an idea. Okay. Thank you. So Anand, I've got a question for you. Sure. So I worked with data.gov.in, I mean on the beta version of it. Okay. Just the visualizations part. Okay. So the real pain was, you know, the data which which was there only, okay? So it's on PDF, okay, we all know that. Sometimes the open data format is such that it is very crappy indeed. When I say crappy, I mean you got null entries, you got the data is not consistent enough. So is there any automated way that you, you know, d make the data more consistent so that so I can directly... Not really. So the thing is, uh, data is crappy. At least like you can get the crappy data that's, more, that's so much valuable. For example, when I got the word information, okay, so uh, there is one polling booth, uh, 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 I guess in East Bangalore, is in uh, uh, JC Nagar ward. Uh, very unlikely, okay. But these guys just enter data like that and we can't help, okay. So we have to go and manually fix those kind of entries. Uh, yeah, you basically spoke about uh, making data handling easier during elections. So what happens to all that data once the elections are over? No, so this is data is not about elections really. Okay, it's not election results or something. This is about uh, the structure of political uh, boundaries in the country. So how many states we have, what's a, uh, what are the parliamentary constituencies we have, what are the assembly constituencies, and then what are the polling booths inside each one of them. Okay, and. Um, uh, a lot of these tools are still valuable. For example, if you look at the, the voluntary sign-up system that I built. So I built a small service with an API. So given a location, it tells you what, what you belongs to. For example, if you want to do some uh, uh, work in, Bang in what's in Bangalore, you could just use it even now. I think uh, we should really have a repository of all this open data so that anybody can uh, use it when they need. Uh, uh, you should really spend your time on uh, uh, doing your work, not on uh, uh, doing all these kind of things, right? So, I mean, you want to spend time on doing election campaign, not uh, sitting and scraping stuff. Well, uh, I have a question. <coughs> uh, you told me you had some problem with the report lab PDF yeah. uh, conversion. What is the base data that you converted to PDF? Was it HTML or? No, so I, uh, no, I basically have tabular data. So I have parts of PDFs and got the tabular data. Okay. And all you, all you printed the the, you know, the, the PDF. So I have yeah. the uh, I have the name, house number, uh, uh, gender, age, uh, their voter ID, and booth and serial number. So I have a tabular data. I want to put that as a table. Okay. So I was putting uh, uh, like you see, like putting uh, two entries in a page, uh, and then. Uh, uh, I was trying to uh, print for one polling center. Okay, so when there are more than like the two, many number of when the number of pages is high, it was just taking forever. Uh, I have some experience with uh, you know converting text to PDF and printing. Okay, I always found text to markdown, markdown to PDF much faster actually. 
Okay. I'm just saying. But it's not plain text. It's actually uh, a table. Okay. Yeah, I want to create uh, tables in Markdown. We can, you know, do Markdown to PDF. It's pretty fast, actually. I'm just uh, wondering if you tried that option. So no, Markdown to PDF, or so. Uh, you know, I'm not tried, but I kind of see that that's a converting HTML to PDF, right? Almost. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. You can use the. I don't know if you know this toolkit called. Uh, 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 I don't think it's Pandoc. It's basically uh, I forgot the name of that, but uh, it's it's not really report lab. Okay. It uh, it has this toolkit. Uh, I think which uh, which gives you this command line option called PD HTML to PDF. No, okay. I'll tell you the issue with HTML to yeah. PDF is. Uh, I'll show you. Let me show you that uh, thing that. Uh, so, yeah. So it's this. Okay. So now. I, I think it's pizza. Pizza. Sorry. Pizza. Okay. So pizza ta table. tables doesn't work very well with HTML printing. The reason is, now I have a table and the header, if you see, I want it to be repeated in every page. Right? So the top header name, relation name, etc. It has to repeat in every page. Okay. The report lab, you can just say, uh, log the first row. So that it will be repeated in every page. Okay. Because report lab is meant for uh, printing on pages. Whereas HTML and Markdown are not for printing purpose. Okay. So, uh, you can probably want to print this table uh, in Markdown. Okay. But, uh, uh, you won't be able to repeat those kind of things and also putting these two uh, tables together in a single page would be very hard to do in Markdown. Yeah. Hey, and um, uh, I, I used to work in the uh, report li uh, libraries, but I had some uh, problem with the versions of the PDF. So some PDF, uh, you know, some header was wrong, so I'm not able to read at all. Then I manually have to save it in a different version and, you know, start using it. Do you have any, do you have any experience on that? No, so this is really, uh, I looked at report lab and just spent two days and uh, cooked up something. Okay, I'm really not an expert in report lab. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I know you guys have a lot of questions from Anand. Okay, so he's being one of the prominent speakers in PyCon. So what you can do is you can catch up with him after this talk. Uh, meanwhile, you can go out for lunch and come back to the audio one so there will be another session you can check the uh, session plan out.